Hey, <lacht> Silly Huhn ist mal wieder hier am Start auf sillyhuhn.com. Alternativ natürlich immer noch die IP 149.202.137.134. Let's go. Gratis erreichbarer Server Minecraft Laser Land. Wir sind hier mit Herzog Gandalf am Start ähm, und pressen uns heute den Talk von dem The Tor Project Channel. Ein Video von 2016 mit dem Titel Understanding, the, uh, Understanding Tor Onion Services and the Use Cases. Hope uh, 6, 2016, I don't know, Hope XI, ich nehme an, es ist 6. Ähm, genau, und wir sind hier am ähm, Traveln, äh, ja, einfach Richtung weg vom Spawn, damit, ähm, naja, alles schön safe bleibt. Und, ähm, wenn ihr alle joint, ne? Also nicht vergessen, joinen. IP 149.202.137.134 ähm, oder alternativ ähm, momentan die Domain sillyhuhn.com. Ich weiß nicht, ähm, wie lange ich noch für diese Domain zahlen werde. Vermutlich noch eine Weile, aber. Also eigentlich ist weder IP noch Domain geplant, dass die sich ändert, aber wer weiß, vielleicht geht ja eins davon früher down, deswegen habt ihr bald das 1.9.202.137.134 und äh, silihum.com und jetzt schauen wir uns den Talk an hier, ne? Understanding Tor Onion Services and Their Use Cases. Let's go! Hello everyone, uh, this is our second talk, so I guess you know us. Uh, Today we're going to talk about understanding of Tor Onion Services. So, just off the bat, Tor Onion Services used to be called Hidden Services. Uh, we changed the name uh, for obvious reasons, uh, especially media, like if, uh, when it's Hidden Services, uh, put bad things in there. Uh, so, first of all, uh, this talk uh, is going to be a much more technical than yesterday. Uh, we're going to go deep into Hidden Services, uh, attacks, next generation, so on and so forth, but also use cases. Uh, first of all, we're going to start with uh, how Tor works, because we didn't do that yesterday and this is an important part, so we all understand what are uh, different parts of the network. So, this slide, you probably, uh, you probably saw the, 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 that diagram many times, EFF has one. So basically, Alice wants to talk to Bob, uh, goes through the network, and then encrypted links are the blue ones. And the first one is the guard. So it's very important that you understand what a guard is because we're going to talk about guards quite a bit. Uh, guard is the entry node. Uh, so you get a guard after a while when you're really stable enough and it's fast enough. And then you get this flag so people can start using you. Uh, every client, every hidden services, uh, every uh, component in the network interacts with the Tor circuits. You use a guard and will pin the guard for around three months. And our reasons behind that, we won't go into details, you can ask us. But keep in mind, this guard, you have it for a long time. Then you go to a middle, middle is any, pretty much any relay, and then exits. So the exits, uh, in this case, uh, uh, this is just a Tor circuit. In case of Onion services, we, you don't have exit because you don't exit the network. Uh, but uh, exits are spe very special uh, nodes in the, in the network because traffic gets unencrypted there and sent into the open interweb, unsecure in, uh, internet. So, This is what we call the Tor circuits, three ops, basically. So, a uh, quick overview of uh, what uh, hidden services are, onion services now. So, basically, one uh, data onion address, 16 character long, it's base32, it's pretty easy to understand there. Uh, it's a client services side, both are hidden. So, both have anonymous, uh, are anonymous. So, it's a very important property because uh, as a client and as a server, you can protect yourself. Uh, everything stays in inside the Tor network. That means that uh, the onion service traffic doesn't go outside, it doesn't go through an exit node as on the internet. And also the TCP traffic. Remember, Tor is, al is only TCP. Uh, so, quick history here. Uh, Eden services are quite old. 2004, this is the first commit uh, about Eden services. Uh, 2004 is, what, 12 years ago, so uh, pretty old. So, we're going to show you how uh, this has been evolving. Uh, first of all, so in 2014, maybe to the beginning of 2015, we started to uh, add statistics to, me to try to measure what's going on in the Eden service world. Uh, this was a quite a bit of a challenge. It took us many months, actually, to come up with a uh, privacy uh, uh, way, a way 
to collect those statistics in a privacy-oriented uh, way. So this is the amount of unique Daltonian addresses that are currently in the network. We don't know what happened in March. Someone, you know, just created half a million of those, and uh, and then it, it, it went back. So right now we're around 60,000 unique onion addresses. So that means uh, 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 unique ways. We don't know. I mean, we don't know if it's clients, servers, or whatever. But right now this is the state. And this is the traffic. So those are the two statistics we have, the number of onions and the traffic. Uh, so yeah, this, uh, I don't know. We, we absolutely don't know what happened. Again, uh, it dropped. Maybe like someone leaked a huge thing and stuff. Uh, we don't know. Uh, but overall, uh, what it gave us is a way to show that hidden, tr uh, hidden, tr hidden services, sorry, onion services, are still very, very low amount of traffic on the overall Tor network. So it's, uh, every client that connects to an onion services, it's around 4% of the overall uh, traffic in the Tor network. So when you hear in the media or whatever, the governments or propaganda that uh, toys, only bad things on the dark web. Well, remember that it's only 4% of this overall traffic. And in this 4%, it's also a small percentage. So now we're going to go into properties and use cases. It's pretty nice. All right. So um, hidden services or onion services have a lot of um, interesting uh, properties. First of all, they are self-authenticated. Uh, they are end-to-end -end encrypted. Self-authenticated in a way that like, um, if two, um, a server and a client are talking to each other, they don't know where, like, the server doesn't know where the client is and the client doesn't know where the server is. They just know each other and uh, they can authenticate uh, with each other uh, with, with different layers of encryption. And, uh, but they, ju they know like, who that person is, but they don't know where that is and what's the IP address. Um, they are end-to-end -end encrypted. There is uh, no need for uh, CA Mafia, basically, uh, to get a certificate for whatever. And um, you can pretty much do a lot of isolation um, when you run an Onion service in a way that you can basically run um, a server somewhere. It could be on a Raspberry Pi in your apartment, and uh, it doesn't even have to ha be uh, exposed to the internet, like, globally. Like, it doesn't have to have an static IP address. It can, you can do a lot of NAT punching because Onion addresses don't really need a, a, a public IP address. Um, you can minimize the surface attack uh, just by doing that and, and other stuff. Um, you can do uh, a stealth mode that I'm going to talk about a little bit. And you can, um, like in a stealth mode, basically, uh, even if you have the, the even um, like somehow people find the address of the Onion address, they cannot like connect to it directly without the, key, the, the, uh, the actual key that they need. And um, you can use unique sockets to basically get rid of uh, TCP in your uh, setup. And uh, they are censorship resistant. Uh, nobody can censor an onion address. And there is also like when you use onion addresses, there is no DNS uh, or BGP hijacking, poisoning bullshit. Um, so here's a, a stealth mm -hmm. mode. Um, you basically need to um, add to our C file and add this option that uh, it's hidden service authorized client. Um, and in, in this mode, um, what happens is that each client that wants to connect to your hidden service or onion service has a unique onion address with a unique key. So they should have like uh, this, um, the, the first part is the onion address and the middle part is the um, unique key. And then uh, the, the last part is the, the client and you can see the like, user one, two, three have different onion addresses and different keys. Uh, this helps because uh, you know, like if, if you uh, want to have an special infrastructure set up, um, which I'm going to talk about uh, later a little bit. So uh, what are the use cases of onion addresses? Uh, what, like, is it like everybody thinks of onion addresses just for, I don't know, like um, a, a crazy website um, to deal drugs and whatever. But that's not the, whole, the only thing. Because of all the good properties, um, health sector could, uh, could take advantage of these things. Um, the um, government services for, uh, you know, like a lot of the things that um, governments do, uh, they don't necessarily need to collect all that information about people to, you know, like uh, we've heard um, about OPM hack and, and all of the different things. Uh, tip lines, abuse complaints, whistleblowing platforms, uh, you all know about SecureDrop and Global Leaks. 
there is a there, there is a magazine that is only available over Onion. It's called Tourist. Um, yeah, and there are um, uh, some person like some artists also dropped and uh, their whole album on uh, on Onion addresses. So if you wanted to uh, download the album, you had to like go to the Onion ad Onion address. You can uh, secure your vulnerable infrastructure. You can take advantage of this in libraries for like library catalogs and, and everything. This is like especially uh, especially interested uh, interesting for me because I work with Library Freedom Project. Um, you can uh, Nathan of Guardian Project did a thing on Internet of Things Home Assistant. Like basically, if you if you are if you want to run one of these things in your um, apartment. You, you don't need to expose the whole thing to the internet. If you want to connect it from your mobile phone to that service, it doesn't have to be open to the internet. Uh, you can just connect over Onion address, and it's pretty, pretty much safer uh, than internet. Um, so if, like, uh, a lot of people, like, uh, you know, have this question, like, what about malicious exit nodes? What if, like, I don't know, some, um, some government agency or some bad actors are, uh, you know, like running a bunch of exit nodes and taking over um, all the running exit nodes. So basically, whenever you use Onion addresses, as David mentioned, you never use the exit nodes. You never exit the, the traffic. You uh, that you never exit the, the Tor network. So uh, the exit, none of the nodes actually know what what's what's happening. There is like a Tor Tor um, daemon on the server that uh, like all the applications are connecting to that uh, daemon server, uh, uh, that, that Tor daemon on the server over Unix socket. And uh, there is a Tor daemon on the client side that all the, um, everything is, it, is either going through Tor browser or if you're, um, you know, like if you're doing a crazy creative setup, it's also using socket. So you're like only just Tor Tor. Um, you can use it for file sharing, right? Onion share. There is messaging applications like Ricochet that basically needs no um, server in middle. Like there is no, um, there is like there is just there are just two clients talking to each other, and that's it. Like there is nothing else. There there is no need for OTR or anything because it's already encrypted. And uh, the you know like when two people are talking to each other, it's it's fascinating because. Even if like um, the original level of Ricochet like disappears tomorrow, or I don't know if like he abandoned the project or whatever happens, you can uh, still take advantage of it, and it, it works forever. And um, the other thing is that like it, it basically eliminates the, the issue of metadata all in one. Uh, there is no username, there is no password, there is no metadata at all. Like nobody like if somebody uh, looks at your traffic, they can't even tell. That you are chatting, like they can, they can, they can't tell what you are exactly doing. Um, you could run on cloud um, instances for I don't know, like a lot of different things. And um, you, I, I have a lot of repositories that uh, are in my apartment, and I only connect to them over um, Onion. And uh, the interesting use case could be like all of the mobile apps could, uh, like if you're um, an Android developer or iOS developer, you can basically put. Uh, this service in if you want to like fetch config files or whatever, especially if you're in, uh, if your users are in censored areas. We will talk about that later because fa Facebook did something awesome uh, with, with this regard. So I want to talk about like an special use case that is actually, uh, this is based on true story. It's, it's already happening in the wild. So imagine that you're having um, a web, you're running a website and that, that website you are like doing things uh, correctly, and um, that HTTP, uh, that that PHP website is like uh, the app server is on a different VM. There is uh, there is a I don't know like nginx reverse proxy on the web server that is serving a, um, a static HTML, and you have a you know DB uh, MySQL like like imagine that this is the WordPress uh, website with a bunch of vulnerable plugins and whatnot. And then um, you have users, contributors uh, to that website that need to basically connect to the app server. Now, if you, um, like, when you have this setup, even, like, even though it's, like, um, you know, distributed and, like, everything is compartmentalized, and uh, there is a still uh, the risk of exposure. There's the risk of exposure of your uh, PHP uh, server, application server, and there is the risk of exposure of your DB server. But if you do it over Onion, uh, what happens here is that only 
the user, like each, each of these onions are unique onion addresses. So what happens here is that the database doesn't, none of these, nor, not the database nor the application server have a public IP address. What happens is that they only talk to each other, the application server and DB over onion and especially if you do uh, the stealth mode, as I explained um, in previous slides, you you need to have like a very unique um, onion address and the key to be able to connect to each other. So even if somebody finds the onion address uh, of your database, they are not going to be able to connect to it. Um, so it's going to be like much. It, it makes it much much harder. The other thing is that if you have multiple users. Uh, multiple contributors, each contributor gets a unique um, onion address. So if, for example, one of them gets compromised for whatever reason, you don't need to change anything. You All you have to do is to, like, basically, if I um, go back to this thing, you just comment out uh, that user uh, uh, thing, uh, like, uh, the, that, that user, or, like, delete it from your Tor C file, and they be, that basically that onion doesn't work anymore and you, you leave the rest of the infrastructure in place, nothing um, compromises. Um, all right. All right, okay. So uh, now it's gonna get extremely technical, so uh, be careful. All right, uh, onion services work. So we're gonna make uh, an overview of how onion services, onion services, geez. onion services <laughs> uh, The step one, so there's, there's multiple things here. Uh, in this slide, you'll see Alice, which is a client who will try to go to the service. And we have, in this case, uh, the big Tor network, which is a big cloud, uh, obviously. And then uh, the introduction points. So this, this first thing is introduction points. The service will pick, at random, three introduction points. Introduction points are relays in the network. We have 7,000 of them in the network, so just pick three of them. Uh, and uh, we'll create what we call a descriptor. So this descriptor uh, is basically a text file that explains how to get to the service. Uh, some fancy crypto and uh, uh, ad addresses of where to go and so on and so forth. The service will upload this descriptor to a directory. We call those HS directory. Uh, HS for hidden service. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot change that to onion service for now, so keep in mind, HS directory it is an onion service directory. Uh, and then, What's going to happen is that Alice will fetch the descriptor from the directory, and with this information, with the descriptor, knows how to reach the service. At the same time, uh, Alice will create a circuit to a rendezvous point, so the RP in this slide. Uh, this RP is, again, a random relay that Alice will pick. So what's going, what's going to happen is Alice will go to an introduction point, and uh, Alice knows where it is because it's in the descriptor. Uh, and tell the service, please meet me at this rendezvous point. Uh, and then the service connects to the rendezvous point and, uh, at this, and kill the circuit with the introduction point. And then we have a six op circuit between Alice and the service. And it's very important because three ops on one side, three ops on the other side, well, we have an army on both sides. Um, so this, those are the basics of what our hidden services works. Uh, Please try to remember the introduction point, your uh, rendezvous point in directory, because uh, we're going to talk quite a bit about them. Directory. So this is all. There's this uh, this problem here that uh, how which directory Alice needs to connect to to get the descriptor, since there's actually directory here. There's only one, but in reality there are six. Uh, so the descriptor is uploaded to six different directories. Now in this case here, it's easy. Just create a hash, take the onion address, some time period, which is basically the time right now until uh, UTC, blah, blah, blah. You can read the spec. And then the descriptive cookie, in this case, it's empty. So the descriptive cookie is used for authentication. So when you add a client, you have this extra key. Well, this is how this, this, this with only this extra key, you know which is the descriptor ID. And then a replica. Replica is basically which HS0. Uh, and then you have a descriptor ID. So it's a long string. This descriptor ID. When we base 64 to 16, this one, and it gives us a bunch of numbers. And at that point, uh, this is while the service and the client, remember, because this computation here, uh, it is deterministic. So that means Alice and the service will compute the same thing. Now, with 3378, each relay network has a fingerprint. And then we're going to upload 
this descriptor to the closest relays for matching the fingerprint. In this case, we have 7A, 7B, and 7D. So we have thicker three relays in the network, DR and R, HSD. This HSD gets the descriptor, stores it for 24 hours. Well, 18 to 24 hours, depending on. So it looks like this a, a mash ring. H the descriptor ID starts, and then you upload to three HSD replica 0, replica 1. So we have symmetry in there, and we, we go over the network. We spread out over the network. Uh, so uh, now you know how agent service works, you know what the directory is, and all this, it's uh, basically a design that is, was made in 2004, implemented, fixed over the years, but then cracks started to form. Uh, this is why we are going into this next generation in the service so that we were taught at length after, uh, just after we got us talking about the cracks. Uh, so in first thing is that currently right now in, uh, oh yeah, so in Tor, we, in the last two years, it was a huge effort to get rid of all cryptography. Well, we, let's call it weak cryptography. Um, and hidden services right now is the only remaining, remaining piece in Tor that uses RC-124. Uh, not SHA-1. SHA-1 does other things, but RC-124. So yeah, in this case, uh, is this sync uh, getting plausible with hidden services? We don't know. Uh, but uh, it's a problem. Now, another thing. Directory gets the descriptor. Remember the descriptor, the text file that informs you all where to go. In the descriptor, you know, this is a, a snippet of a descriptor. You have this RC public key, which we call the permanent key. Basically, you are in address. So it's very easy for any directory, any relay that has the HSD flag, gets descriptors, get, and it's in clear text, and then just compute the onion address. So what we call enumerating onion addresses. Uh, this attack has been going on, uh, unfortunately, in the Tor network, and we are actively trying to detect that, actually, because it's a very harmful thing. Because people are just running relays, harvesting onion addresses, and not only that, but they're creating business model around that to crawl the dark web. Dark web. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really bad. It's, uh, and we know about that. There's, there's literally hundreds of companies doing that. Uh, so this other thing... Uh, you can pull off a bunch of attacks, unfortunately, with uh, uh, being an HSD uh, and also a guy we're going to talk about at length. Uh, and what do we call the HSD camping attack? So a relay can change its fingerprint very easily. And since this descriptor ID and uh, the computation is deterministic, you know that in two years where it's going to be because the time period goes in. So you just compute this old hash with the onion address, the same invariant. The scripted cookie, the replica, there's all the numbers that are, and then the only thing that changes is time period. So this time period in two years, you just add two years, and you know exactly where it's going to be. So we have relays do, to attack the, the network do that. They change their fingerprint to have this exact place where they need, they need to be, this, like the HSD2 here. Uh, and then they get the onion address. So let's say you want to monitor uh, WikiLeaks uh, uploads. Well, you just take up WikiLeaks onion address, and you compute your fingerprint to be specifically this, the, the right one for the HSD, and then you can just know who is, how many people are fetching uh, WikiLeaks services. Here in the Ash Ring, basically, you camp, and you know it is. So one of these attacks, I'm going to go a bit faster, is uh, the HSD dynamization thing. It's a timing thing. So hidden services are at specific patterns of, of uh, circuit creation. Remember, I'm going to upload to directory, and then, uh, 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 oh, in this case, it's client, sorry. The client is very specific. It's the same for it in service. Uh, I'm going to fetch the descriptor from directory, open an RP circuit, connect, uh, connect the IP. So in this case, uh, I put timings, if you can see. So, but the, the point is just to, if you're a malicious guard, and also a malicious HSD, this is how the attacks goes in. You want to correlate who is getting which admin address from the directory. And as a guard, you know which client on which circuit is connecting, uh, is getting the signing address. So use timings here. First, first, uh, first circuit, you get the directory. Two seconds later, one second later, you have the circuit is killed. So it's very specific, uh, distinct pattern here. What's going to happen is that Alice creates an, uh, an RP connection and an RP connection, and then at the same seconds, so it's not visible again. And then the circuit is killed at the IP once you introduce yourself, and then he goes to the RP. And once the RP is done, well, traffic goes through the circuit. So you see this very, very distinct pattern, uh, a, 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 three different circuits, timings, and then, oh, you know which onion address is. In this case, it's a bit difficult to pull off because you have guard and directory, you need to be the, the malicious attacker that needs to control both. 
And remember, your guard also rotates every three months. And one of the reason is uh, we don't want your client or agent service to uh, rotate guards quickly so that the attacker can make you pick his guard. Now, this is a much more fun attack. Okay, so here's another interesting attack. Um, imagine that uh, there is an attacker, that uh, pumpkin thing on the top right, which uh, wants to learn the guard node of an onion service. Guard node is the first hop of, a, of every circuit from an onion service. So it's basically the only relay on the whole network that knows the IP address of the onion service. So it's a, it's a, it's a significant relay for that onion service, basically. Now imagine that the pumpkin has also set up a few middle relays around the network, malicious, bad relays. And uh, here is the attack that it can pull off, basically. It knows the onion address of the, uh, of the, of the onion service, so like, for example the Wikileaks onion service. And uh, since it knows the address, it can uh, pretend to be many, many clients. It can pretend to be 9,000 clients and try to establish 9,000 circuits to the onion service. And um, and, uh, well, let's move to the next slide, actually. It's uh, more graphical. So, l imagine that the, the pumpkin on the right asks the onion service on the left to establish 9,000 circuits because it, it pretends to be 9,000 individual clients. The onion service has to, has to do this because it doesn't know that the attacker is actually one bad guy. So it starts creating circuits. And every time it creates a circuit, it uses the same guard node, but it changes the middle node. The middle node is, is, a, is, a, is a different random relay every time. And uh, since the attacker has middle nodes on the network, eventually, like, if it asks for enough circuits, eventually the onion service will pick one of the attacker-controlled middle nodes. So, for example, the, the second... Okay, <coughs> Leute, also the talk is super spannend and so, but I have enough people. Ich bin schon ein bisschen am Traveln gewesen hier auf Kamera mit irgendwelchen nicht Creative Commons äh, Talks, weil ich äh, lasse immer nur Videos abspielen im Hintergrund, wo ich die volle Rechte dran habe. Nur wenn die auf YouTube äh, als Creative Commons markiert sind, dann hat man das Recht, glaube ich, mit Namensnennung die auch selber nochmal hochzuladen einfach und wirklich alles damit zu machen. Ähm, genau, und da habe ich ein paar Black Hat Talks interessiert, die leider nicht diese Lizenz hatten, deswegen bin ich jetzt hier schon seit gefühlt, ich glaube, ich weiß nicht, viel zu lange schon unterwegs, ihr könnt ja nachschauen, wie weit ich getravelt bin seit der letzten Folge, wir sind jetzt hier fast schon bei 60.000, ähm, genau, wir sind jetzt hier bei 28 Minuten und, äh, fast 25 Minuten und 8 Sekunden in dem Talk, immer noch Understanding to Onion Services and their Use Cases, Hope äh, 6 2016, ähm, Genau, also falls euch das interessiert, ist wie immer natürlich in der Beschreibung verlinkt, ähm, mit Bildern und äh, besserem Ton. Äh, ich weiß nicht, ob ich dann in der nächsten Episode weiterschauen werde oder ob ich mir das mal irgendwann off-camera weiter anschauen werde. Also, ja, verlasst euch da nicht drauf. Ähm, genau. Mit wem rede ich eigentlich? Diese Videos bekommen so zwischen 0 und einem View und wahrscheinlich schaut soweit eh keiner, aber... Uh, ja, genau. Und dann natürlich nicht vergessen, hier auf den Server beitreten mit der, äh, unter der IP-Adresse erreichbar 149.202.127.134. Ähm, oder habe ich jetzt irgendwas verdreht? Keine Ahnung. Äh, jetzt natürlich auch die Domain. Seit es die Domain gibt, äh, habe ich natürlich keine Ahnung mehr von den IP-Adressen. Die Domain ist silly. Ups, äh, wieso drücke ich immer zweimal T? Sillyhuhn.com. Genau, hier der Server ist wahrscheinlich noch länger online und erreichbar. Alles klar, dann bis zur nächsten Folge.